There's a new Batman movie out. It's called The Batman. Damn, I hope nobody pulled a muscle coming up with that title. Take it easy, you Hollywood wonder wizards. You're gonna lose the hoi polloi. Catch my drift? Anyway, by the time this video goes up, I will have seen the movie. Unfortunately, I have not seen the movie as of the time I'm shooting this, which is right now for me, but a few days from now for you. So I'm going to do that thing late night talk show hosts do when they tape a show before a World Series game that doesn't air until after the game and just kind of refer non-committally to the existence of the movie. How about that new Batman movie, huh? Sure was something, wasn't it? How'd you like that Robert Pattinson? He definitely gave a performance that a number of people will be talking about for a certain period of time for some reason. And let's not leave out the supporting cast. You got Alfred, Jim Gordon, Catwoman, the Penguin, and speaking of the Riddler, that brings me to my actual subject. Because while I haven't seen the movie yet as I'm recording this, it's pretty obvious from the marketing that the main villain of this movie is the Riddler, but he's not the manic, over-the-top goofball we typically imagine that character to be. He's apparently been patterned after the Zodiac Killer. This ain't your father's Riddler. Or your grandfather's Riddler. And actually, full disclosure, in my case, that would be my father's Riddler. And that would be my Riddler, because I'm old. Halfway through the average human life expectancy. Not to say I think about it a lot, because I don't. The new movie's darker take on the Riddler is certainly a departure from the way the character has typically been presented in the comics and in the various TV and film adaptations in which he has appeared, but it's not the first time someone has tried to show us a Riddler who is more fearsome than funny more deadly than Daffy. But before I get to that, a little character history. The Riddler, real name Edward Nigma, debuted in Detective Comics number 140 in 1948. We learned that in school he would cheat to win puzzle contests in order to trick his classmates into thinking he was smarter than he actually was. He eventually becomes a legitimate master at puzzles, which leads to what must have been a lucrative career running a booth at a carnival where he challenges customers to outwit him at solving puzzles and still cheats to make sure he wins. But soon he grows tired of being a carny, and who can blame him? Sure, he's probably swimming in cash and betting down with a different pinup girl every night, for such is the existence of the carnival game stand proprietor. But there's more to life than money, women, and essentially unlimited quantities of drugs, which no doubt are also his for the asking. Edward Nigma yearns for a challenge. So one day he says to himself, you know, I'm so good at puzzles, I bet I could become a supervillain who works puzzles into his crimes. I could outwit the police and even Batman. So he gets a costume from somewhere, and there you go. He's the Riddler. Comics were simpler back then, mostly because they were written for children. But even so, as an adult, I find that narrative modesty disarming and kind of refreshing. In his original comic book incarnation, Edward Nigma doesn't become the Riddler because of some horrible trauma. There's no ironic tragedy in his backstory that breaks him and motivates him to adopt a costumed persona. He's just a guy who likes puzzles and is kind of an asshole. Because he's a product of the late Golden Age and because of the silly nature of his gimmick, most Riddler stories, even up to the present day, have been fairly lighthearted. He's one of the Cape Crusaders' most well-known and recognizable villains, typically thought of as being just below the likes of the Joker and the Penguin in the pecking order of Batman's rogues gallery, but compared to the Joker or Ra's al Ghul or Bane, he doesn't seem like much of a threat. The creators of the new Batman movie are hoping to change that, but they aren't the first to have the idea. There's a three-part story arc that ran in DC's monthly Batman title back in 1990 that also attempts to show the Riddler in a more serious light. It begins in Batman number 452 
It's written by Peter Milligan with pencils by Kieran Dwyer and inks by Dennis Yanka, and it's titled Dark Knight, Dark City. The first scene gives us a sense of the grim yet goofy tone we're in for with this story as we witness a group of men in the 18th century preparing to perform a ritual to summon a demon. One of these men, in a random detail that means nothing and goes absolutely nowhere, is Thomas Jefferson. Anyway, the ritual involves a young woman who has been specially prepared for her role, who is called the Human Bat. The Human Bat must be sacrificed to the demon, and in return, the demon will fall under the control of the man performing the ritual. Seems fair. But before Jacob Stockman, the man holding the knife and providing the narration for this scene, can complete the sacrifice, we cut to present-day Gotham City, where Batman is on his way to meet Commissioner Gordon. These scenes are narrated by another voice, which eventually identifies itself as the voice of Gotham. Neat! Gordon has summoned Batman after receiving a call from the Riddler telling them to be on the roof at midnight. As they're standing there chatting about how the Riddler's given himself a police code name, Oedipus, solver of the riddle of the Sphinx, a woman dressed up as a Sphinx climbs onto the roof and recites a riddle. Generally, my leaves aren't turned at night. Usually, I'm full of worms by day. Lots of words, but deathly quiet. Batman's like, cool, thanks for coming. And the Sphinx lady is like, no problem, and jumps off the roof. Batman tries to save her, but when he catches her by the ankle with a bat rope, it just swings her around through the window of an Italian restaurant. So anyway, Brenda and Eddie were the popular steadies, and the king and the queen at the- Oh, shit! She's dead. Meanwhile, the Riddler is at the Gotham University Library. Leaves aren't turned at night, leaves as in pages full of worms by day, bookworms, lots of words but deathly quiet. Get it? Riddler is holding two security guards hostage. Oh, did I say two? Make that one, because he just shot the other one in the head and splattered his blood all over the spine of In Cold Blood. That's clever. I see what you did there. Batman has solved the riddle and is on his way to the library, but before he gets there, we get another scene of the sacrifice ritual from the 1700s. Stockman is about to kill the young woman playing the role of the human bat when Thomas Jefferson steps in and says, Whoa, 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 you're actually going to kill her? I thought this was only make-pretend devil worship. They argue for a second, but then the demon, which takes the form of a giant bat, of course, appears in the doorway. He's been summoned, but there's no sacrifice. So, as you might expect, he's a little bit salty. Cut back to the present, and Batman arrives at the library. There's the Riddler with the surviving security guard with a noose around his neck, precariously balanced on a pile of books, and right away, Batman should be suspecting that some otherworldly forces are at work here because no human being would stack books like this. Riddler's like, here's a riddle. When I kick the books over, do you save him or does he die? Batman's like, that's not really a riddle. You're just asking a straightforward question with two- Oh shit, he kicked over the books! We see in close-up one of the books on which the guard was standing is Frederick Wortham's Seduction of the Innocent. Peter? Kieran? You boys having fun? Just don't get carried away, okay? Okay. Batman cuts the security guard down with a batarang, but the guy is still hurt pretty bad. Batman gives him mouth-to-mouth and takes him to the hospital, where there's a cop waiting to tell Batman that four newborn babies were just abducted, and one of the abductors left behind a cassette tape, which, for you youngsters, is an audio format that was popular back when the Earth's crust was just starting to cool. I had quite a collection. There's a riddle on the tape, of course. It leads Batman to a blood bank where the Riddler is waiting. Riddler tosses Batman a baby doll, which explodes, covering Batman in blood. I appreciate the detail of having dummy written on the doll's forehead, just so we don't think the Riddler blew up an actual baby. He'd execute a security guard, sure, but he wouldn't blow up a baby. He would toss a baby out in the street in the path of the speeding Batmobile, however which leads to this series of panels where a blood-soaked Batman slams on the brakes, thinks he ran over the baby, then discovers, much to his relief, that he did not, in fact, run over the baby. 
The baby has a card containing another riddle, which Batman solves with some help from Alfred, which leads Batman to a cemetery where Batman encounters a zombie! Hey, is that Bub? Kind of looks like him. In Batman number 453, part two of the story begins with Batman surrounded by zombies, which turn out to not actually be zombies, but mechanical zombies built by the Riddler, plus one guy in a zombie costume to give Batman a little bit of a fight. Riddler kills that guy with a remote control explosive before Batman can interrogate him. What I love about this scene is how casually Batman accepts that he's being attacked by zombies when he thinks they are actually zombies. There's no incredulity, no disbelief, getting swarmed by zombies. Hey, these things happen. It's an amusing reminder that for as gritty and realistic as things supposedly got in the 80s and 90s, the DC Universe was still a pretty kooky place. After the zombies, Batman finds another baby and another riddle, which leads him to McKinley Street. But before that, we get another flashback to Jacob Stockman and the gang, which I remind you includes Thomas Jefferson in the 1700s. Scared shitless after summoning a demon they couldn't control because Jefferson stopped Stockman from going through with the sacrifice. Thanks, Thomas. The guys decide the best thing to do is to flee and board up their demon summoning temple with the young woman, the giant bat, and the demon they summoned but cannot control, trapped together inside. Sounds like a plan. Good thing they invested in that extra thick demon containing door, eh? And demon proof the walls, too, I'm guessing. Who paid for that? You, Jefferson? You planter piece of shit? Batman is at a bar on McKinley Street hoping to find a lead on what Riddler is up to when he's attacked by three dogs. Batman takes out two of the dogs with help from an off-duty cop who happened to be tying one on at the bar and kills the third with a silver knife handed to him by the bartender. Helpful. Batman chases down the van where the dogs came from and finds it being driven by remote control. He hears the Riddler's voice coming through a speaker, luring him to a sewer tunnel, where he finds another of the abducted babies <gasps> choking on a ping pong ball. Riddler's like, good luck saving the baby, Batman, and strolls off. Batman tries dislodging the ball by giving the baby a good solid whack on the back, but it doesn't work. So Batman decides an emergency tracheotomy is his only option. He whips out a knife that is either the silver knife he used to kill the dog a minute ago, in which case I hope he at least wipes it off on his cape or something first, or another knife which he's had on him the whole time, but for some reason never thought to use to stab the attack dog, which would make sense because I never really pictured Batman as the dog-stabbing type even if the dog was actively trying to bite his face off. But I guess if a dog is trying to bite your face off and someone passes you a knife, you figure you've got to stab the dog with it because to do otherwise would be rude. And that's always been Batman's Achilles heel, I feel, his politeness. Part three, Batman number 454, begins with Batman giving the baby the tracheotomy and rushing it to the hospital where he meets up with Commissioner Gordon. There's another riddle pinned to the choking baby's diaper, a riddle that leads Batman to the Hall of Mirrors at a circus sideshow, where he finds a goat, the last missing baby, and one of Riddler's henchmen holding a flamethrower. Batman jumps around to avoid the flames, but the flamethrower henchman manages to escape. Batman heads to the address where he predicts he'll find the Riddler after noticing a pattern in the previous crimes, yes... They form a question mark on a map of Gotham. Do I even need to tell you that? The address is a place in Stockman Square. Jacob Stockman, scumbag would-be human sacrificer, boards up his unholy temple and blows town, still gets a square named after him. Shall we all sing America the Beautiful together? Using the goat as a distraction, Batman bursts into the room where Riddler and his gang are waiting. Batman puts up a good fight, but the bad guys manage to overtake him, and he soon finds himself tied to the altar in Jacob Stockman's old temple, which the Riddler has discovered, along with Stockman's journal, detailing the demonic ritual they attempted back in the 1700s. Riddler has figured out that the demon Stockman and Thomas Jefferson and the rest summoned back then is still here, waiting for its sacrifice. So, for the past few days, Riddler has been preparing Batman to be that sacrifice, 
each unusual encounter they've had has been specially designed to maneuver Batman into undergoing a different stage of the preparation, kissing the lips of a hanged man by giving that security guard mouth to mouth, bathing in human blood when that dummy baby exploded on him at the blood bank, performing a dance macabre with those zombies at the cemetery, slaying a wild dog with a silver dagger, slitting the throat of an unbaptized infant, which Batman was forced to do in order to save the choking baby, and performing an acrobatic Black Sabbath dance in front of a goat, which Batman did earlier to avoid the flamethrower. Now that Batman has been prepared, Riddler can kill him to complete the ceremony, and the demon will fall under his control. But before Riddler can make with the stabby stabs, Batman's like, hey, is something different about you? Because you never used to be such a, you know, bloodthirsty maniac. Riddler's like, no idea what you're talking about now. Come get your stabbing. But then they hear the voice of the demon, who basically tells the Riddler, okay, that'll do. The demon claims to be the spirit of Gotham City. And when Riddler hears that, he's like, you know what? I'm good. And he flees the temple, just like Stockman, Jefferson, and company did back in the day. He also sets the door on fire, then makes a run for it. Trapped inside the temple, which, let's be honest, is pretty much just a basement, Batman hears the demon explain a few more things. He interrupted the ritual because he doesn't want to be controlled. He wants to be free. He's been trapped down here all these centuries, but he could feel the city growing around him. He was able to reach out and control the Riddler, draw him in. The demon knew that once the Riddler got involved, Batman would show up eventually too. And Batman, who the demon views as one of his creations, since Batman is a product of Gotham, would be able to free him. The young woman who was meant to be sacrificed centuries ago is suddenly alive again. The demon tells Batman to free her, that until she is freed, he, the demon, cannot be free. But Batman doesn't really know how to do that, since, you know, the only exit is super on fire. Just then, Alfred comes to their rescue. He opens the door to the temple basement. Batman wraps the woman, whose name is Dominique, by the way, in his cape, and together they charge through the flames to safety. Unwrapping his cape, Batman finds that Dominique is once again a pile of bones, but she's free. Batman lays Dominique to rest in his family crypt. That's nice of him. Ponders how much influence this demon has really had on his life, and then decides ultimately that it doesn't really matter, and makes a mental note to go visit Michael, the baby he saved from choking in the hospital the next day. The end. Not a great story, if I'm honest. The art by Dwyer and Yanka is very good, and the script by Milligan has a few decent ideas, but it never really comes together. On its own merit, this story would not warrant a video in a series titled Best Batman Ever, but because of the new movie and because this is one of the few stories where Riddler is portrayed this grimly, I figured it was worth talking about, and I'm glad I talked about it, because even though it's not exactly a classic, it has a few points of interest. For one thing, it suggests that if you want to do a darker take on the Riddler, you should probably just redesign the guy from the ground up. The Riddler of Dark Knight, Dark City might be blowing away security guards and choking babies, but he's doing it while wearing a domino mask and a bright green jacket covered in question marks. You can chuck a dozen babies into a wood chipper, and I'm still going to have a hard time taking you seriously if you're dressed like the free money guy. For another thing, it demonstrates that you can tell a grim Batman story without depriving Batman of his humanity. This is a grim, grotesque, sometimes gruesome story. Need I remind you of the scene where Batman is covered in blood, slamming on the brakes to avoid running over a baby with the Batmobile? But those dark elements are things Batman is fighting against, not embodying himself. He faces a brutal enemy, but he himself is not brutal. Contrived dog stabbing aside, we see him in a moment of panic when he thinks he's run over the baby with the Batmobile. We see him beating himself up over the possibility that Michael, the choking baby, may die despite his intervention. And we see him treating Dominique's remains with great tenderness and compassion. I like dark, serious Batman. 
He's the Batman I grew up on, but he can't be so dark that he becomes indistinguishable from the villains he opposes. It's not enough that he's sufficiently smart or strong or skilled as a fighter to defeat the likes of the Riddler. That's not what makes him a hero. There's more to being a hero than being able to beat up the villain. The Batman we see in this story isn't chasing down criminals to exercise his personal demons or because he's driven by some other obsession he doesn't understand. He cares about people. He protects people. And he has some emotional range. He's a spooky dude, sure, but he's not dead inside. I wouldn't want him to acquire too sunny of a disposition, unless you're aiming for comedy like the Adam West series, in which case go for it. I think you need that darkness, or at least the pretense of it, for any serious or quasi-serious take on the character to make sense. A big reason why some of Batman's most enduring villains are also the most colorful is because of the contrast they provide to Batman himself. Even back in the latter Golden Age, and following that, the Silver Age, when Batman had gone from frightful urban legend to beloved local celebrity, he was still supposed to be a grim figure, in theory if not in practice. It's fun and interesting to pit that Dark Knight, as he was first called in 1940, against a deranged clown in a purple suit, or a chubby guy in top hat and tails with an arsenal of trick umbrellas, or a puzzle nerd who dresses in a green unitard covered in question marks. Dark versus light is almost always going to be more compelling than dark versus dark, especially when you add in the extra twist that the light side is the villain and the dark side is the hero. So, Dark Knight, Dark City. Best Batman ever? No, not really. It has a lot of the right ingredients, but it's uneven, it overestimates its own cleverness, and it's ultimately just kind of okay. It's notable for its darker, more brutal take on the Riddler, which is what made me want to produce a video about it in the first place, but this story, as written, wouldn't be very good source material for a Batman movie. Unless you could get David Diggs to reprise the role of Thomas Jefferson. At that point, why not make the movie?